Thanks, Gary. And uh, I, li I like the selection box approach to the slides. Um, th that will certainly solicit a few questions. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move to that part of the day where we're going to ask the four presenters that we've had to take their seats, uh, along with the two, two, two people from Queen's. And, and as they're doing that, I'll introduce uh, our two additional speakers to the Q&A session. So uh, I, I suppose, again, Alan needs no introduction. Alan Jones from Professor Alan Jones from Queen's University is going to join the panel as well. Um, Alan uh, has been joint head of Architecture at Queen's from 2008 to 2016 and president of the RSUA from 2012 to 2014 and then also uh, president of the RIBA from 2019 to 21. So, we're in good company with Alan, um, and he's also a fellow MAG member, um, or was previously a MAG member with myself. So we'll try and get a question in there. And uh, we're also joined by um, Siobhan Cox for this section as well. Um, Siobhan's uh, recently come to notoriety with her TED Talk, um, which everybody will be able to enjoy maybe after the event, which is around reimagining construction and building a better future. So the tone of that is right in line with what we're dealing with today. So I think it's over to me to kick off, um, I suppose, the Q&A. And we have uh, collated some questions um, in that regard before the event. So we're going we're to kick off with just some of those. Uh, the first question is to Alan. Um, so we're, we're going to throw that your way. Uh, a key thought at the moment, this has come in from Alistair Bloomer, uh, a key thought at the moment is how we as professionals can drive this area in an environment where regulations and incentives may be lack lacking and the, the mainstream local industry may be somewhat lacking ambition or even resistant to change. Now, we have seen some counter today in, in the, in the, with O'Hare, Felix O'Hare as well. So that might not just be the case across the board, but Alan, how does that question resonate with you? Um, where I would start, um, some of you will know Joan McCoy, uh, who is one of the co-founders of White Ink Architects here in Belfast. And um, she was presenting to our students last August um, our part threes. And she sort of uh, showed the, um, the, the guidance documents, that what we call our sort of technical booklets. And she's saying, these are not the regulations. And when you look at actually the building regulations, they are very, very general. It must be safe. It must be... Uh, able to transfer loads from the top to the bottom and into the ground. Those are the regulations. And I think where regulations are really going now, on the back of what Joan was saying, is it's becoming much more of a um, future-proofing and much more of an ethical decision. So I'm pleased to see Gary put up the ethical practice guide that came out last year from the RIBA. I'd recommend that to everybody because those are discussions to have with clients. Uh, about it's not about meeting mi minimum. What was clear even from what Michael Gove did uh, with the um, the two stairs in, in tall buildings, he just made a decision. And but what in his speech about that decision, he pointed out the gradual evolution of standards. So we're not building for now, and uh, we have to be able to explain that to our clients. Um, as the professions, I noticed so many of the slides um, having. Uh, numerous professional sort of logos, you know, the uh, ISTRUCT, uh, RIBA, RSUA, we're all there. And this is, it's bigger than one profession. It's everybody together. And we need to be able to explain to our client bodies and to our government that this is really, um, it's a collective issue. You know, again, the slides are showing how much impact there is negatively in terms of the construction industry, building and operating buildings and travelling to them. So if we really want to have a better future, we have to look at um, helping clients understand. And I think part of a way to do that is to show clients what I call the dots. Like I seem to, uh, uh, I describe what I'm doing at the minute, is trying to help people see the dots and join them up. And one document that I can, um, I refer to very often is a report that came out in 2021 from the Strategic Projects Authority in Westminster. I know we're sitting here in Northern Ireland. But to me, it's a sort of like a flag waver that sort of says, or a signpost that explains that document transforming uh, infrastructure performance. You've got to remember, infrastructure are, uh, is not just buildings and 
or not, but it's not just roads and railway lines and so on, and coastal defences. It's also social housing, libraries, uh, hospitals, um, all sorts. And in that, they make it clear, and this is a document that was advice to the Treasury and to the Cabinet Office. So you sort of think of the two sort of powerhouses of government in London, and it's explaining to them that no longer can projects be, um, that success is no longer about being on budget and on programme. And so uh, we have to help um, uh, bring that to the attention, uh, to help clients and our government um, understand how uh, we have to look beyond that. It's about now thinking of um, the connectivity between projects um, and where they sit together, how actually, how they define in that document of a successful building. Uh, it might not, I, I, don't, I try to stop myself now saying a building because a building might not be the answer. Again, as a profession, we need our, our uh, prof series of professions. We need to be thinking that actually, what is the most appropriate answer? And that opens up a whole myriad of issues around: you know, can we move our fees away from construction cost and move it towards impact and performance? That would be a way of actually. And again, um, for the um, again as the professions um, within the construction industry, we need to be saying. Uh, you need the design team at the very beginning. If there was one strong message from a whole, the, most of the presentations, it is actually, you need to have your design team there at stage zero and stage one, you know, not at stage three. You can download, for example, from the Construction Innovation Hub, the Construction Value Toolkit. They describe a project as being five phases. Sorry, it sounds like a lecture. I'm nearly finished. Um, <laughs> But it, it talks about it in five phases. Um, first phase is establishing the need. Second is optioneering. We saw lots of optioneering diagrams, particularly from Gary. And third, design. And then realisation and then occupation. To me, and we should all be thinking of this, it's all design. As we're establishing need, it's, those are dis strategic design decisions. Gary and myself are agreeing. We need to change the title uh, of the different stages in the plan of work. Strategic design is right there. So we need to be strategic. We need to get the design teams further up the, uh, the pyramid, if you like, and start to make really smart decisions. Very good. Um, really welcome that. Some really innovative thoughts in that, Alan, as well, particularly around the fees. That, that's very interesting. Um, in addition to that as well, I, I really identify with the the form factor thing and getting in there really, really early in those early stages as well. Uh, I'm going to deviate off script a little bit and maybe just open out the floor discussion as well. I think it should be interactive and I'll try and supplement in with the questions that we already have here. Um, I feel the audience haven't had their moment yet, so I'm not sure where the Roman mic is, but uh, if people put up their hands, I'll try and identify people. Uh, Okay, Andy Frew is, is there, and then there's maybe a lady over there in the red, and, and a question here. So we'll maybe try and get them three knocked off pretty quick. So uh, uh, just, just a question for Andy, or if you want to stand up, Andy, and just shout. Yeah, Andy Frew, a question second. I think about uh, two, within a year, about 2% of the houses in Scotland are new houses. Uh, but uh, we now know that with heat networks, you can maybe decarbonise heat supply, use <laughs> uh, wind energy, thermal storage, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, should we insist that any new building, and especially with Gary's comments about underperformance of very many new buildings, should we insist that new buildings uh, have a connection available for uh, a street heat network? It's quite interesting. Uh, I, I'll put that to two people. Um, Gary first, and then Debbie, maybe, just to give a brief comment on that. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick one. Um, it's a moot point, really, in terms of if you need the district heating for new buildings, if you do a passive house uh, approach, because uh, theoretically you only need a heat recovery system. So that's theoretical. In, in reality, that people like a radiator to you know, you know dry their towels and so forth. So uh, we, uh, we did a study uh, back many years ago, Harriet Watt University. We were looking to build an eco-village and looked at all the different types of um, systems in place. Uh, and then all of them were almost autonomous, really. Um, you know, you didn't really need the heat network to then link that for new buildings. However, 
for existing buildings, I think it's, it's an absolute necessary really. So I think if you can extend your district heating systems uh, to, and it's all about density, and I think I'll, I'll hand over, it's, it's all about that kind of return on investment because they're very, very expensive. We've got to watch the, um, uh, the efficiency of it as well. Uh, but again, I think that, yeah, for, for, for new buildings, it's debatable, but for existing, I think, yes. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think um, the heat network we're looking at is like 60, 60 degrees, so it's a high temperature kind of network for the city centre. I think where heat networks come in really handy is where you've got a lot of really old leaky buildings like City Hall um, and your own building um, and a lot of our other buildings. And if you look at the, especially look at the public sector stock, it's, it's not very thermally efficient and um, you know, and you've got a lot of solid wall insulation right across the city, um, lots of small terraced houses. I think that's really challenging to decarbonize that type of stock with a house by house approach. So sticking an air source heat pump on each of those buildings is gonna be quite challenging. Um, the hybrid system offers a lot of hope at that single building level, but I think if uh, where a heat network can really come in and where you can, I mean, we're talking about reaching those targets in time. You've got to have a scalable solution, and I think that's where a heat network can come in. It's almost like a plug and play, um, and you've just got one big energy center. It just makes a lot of sense to have all your plant in one place and then heat exchanger on each of those buildings. It makes it a lot easier for those buildings that are really, really difficult to retrofit um, to, to, to plug into um, like an instant solution. So. Um, but like Gary says, it's, it's not, it's, it's very challenging, uh, it's very expensive, um, and it's really disruptive, digging up roads, putting in a network. So it's really important that we do that in the right place, and we do that where we've got really high density of buildings and a really high heat demand. And because we do have a lot of leaky buildings all across the city, we do have a high heat demand. <laughs> um, so it does make sense to us, and you know the discussions we've had with heat developers um, what we're hearing back from them is that, uh, you know, of all the places on the island of Ireland, um, Belfast is probably the best place to do a heat network, and it's where is the most attractive destination for a lot of heat developers. So that's that's why we're we're looking into it. In terms of mandating people to connect to it, um, I think that you see different models across Europe. In Switzerland, they don't mandate it, um, and that means that the developers have to make it really, really attractive, uh, and I, I probably lean towards kind of giving people choice and making sure that, because um, I, I think it's really important when we're on the transition that we are maintaining consent for that transition to net zero, and I think when you start taking choice away from people, you kind of, there's a risk that you kind of erode that, that consent that you get from the public, and we know that in order to reach net zero, we're gonna need a lot of behavioral change and a lot of consent uh, and a lot of that, you know, is a lot of the emission reductions, I think 60% is going to come down to individual individuals changing. Uh, and I think if we mandate them to change, that's uh, much less likely to work than um, giving them something that is really attractive to them. Okay, thanks, Debbie. Um, hopefully that satisfies Andy's question. We had a hand up over here in the corner, so I'm going to go to that. Hi, I'm Jocelyn from McAdam Design. Today's been really informative, but I have a question for you, Inna. I think, as a structural engineer, I think you think we've more power than we actually have in the sense of getting people to buy in and making those decisions early. Um, I suppose my question really is, you know, it's great when you have the exemplar project that you are doing with Queen's, um, with the public sector body that's really enthusiastic about low carbon and embodied carbon. How have you found that you know, with the private sector clients and the projects that you're doing? And is there any advice that you would give to engineers, you know, that we can kind of relate in our own projects? You probably have to sell it very well to them. And most of our work, I would say, um, is definitely public sector work. And we're kind of, we're pretty good at what we do. Um, in terms of the private sector though, my thinking is a client is still a person and they will have people at the end who use that building. If you can show them why you would change something within the structure, how a little bit of cost increase um, in terms of changing the structure to something which has a lower embodied carbon content can then have that whole life impact. And I think that is the sales pitch for it. Whole life 
cost reduction where you tie in embodied and operational carbon into it. Um, I was so interested where you were saying about the the concrete wasn't the worst one <laughs> in terms of structure, and I think that could be a brilliant selling point for a lot of people. Um, I don't know the feasibility of cross-laminated timber for Northern Ireland specifically, but I know we have a lot of concrete manufacturers here. Um, from the structural engineer designer point of view, I do think that we need earlier engagement with the client, we need better and more productive engagement with them. Um, but hopefully there's clients in the room today and hopefully there's people who work within the private sector who then take away from today that it can be cost efficient, it doesn't have to be a huge big upfront cost and then there is whole life benefits to it as well. Thank you. Can I, can I add to that as well? Sorry, again, it feels like I'm bashing structures here. So, so, um, <laughs> so the iStruct T have a, an amazing structural plan of work, which you should follow, and I'm sure you do. And I think actually part of that is just reinforcing that dialogue with the client. And I think structural engineers are going through a bit of a transition of being almost you know, a stage three responsive kind of bit to being a more active and participatory part of the design team. And I think this is what we're seeing. So you know, don't be shy, be brave with your architects, push them around a bit and show them they have you know, options. Because more often than not, the architects might not realize it, the client might not realize it. So really just be active and really kind of have that open discussion. Make sure if you see something that's not efficient or there is a better way to do it, make sure it gets tabled. If it doesn't get adopted, that's a shame, but at least I have the opportunity. I think that's the key. Can I add a little something you, as well? You're um, more than welcome. Um, I, I think often um, we get put off doing the calculations early on, um, and it's we've had lots of examples today of really useful calculation tools. Um, some are very suitable for the concept design stage, like FC, CGBS one. Um, and I would suggest that as engineers, we should be using those tools, even if our clients aren't asking for them, and bringing that information to the table uh, to show what the potential savings are. I really concur with that as well. We're starting last week, we had the Zeb Summit uh, event in Dublin, and that was a lot of what was there as well. And this collegiality about trying to get everybody to go home and use these tools, play about with them, even take an existing project that's done and input it and see, see for yourself what, what's in that within an office. Um, there's one question over here, which I'm going to go back to, and then I, I'm maybe going to come with one, and then I'll pick up some more on the floor then as well. Oh, thank you, speakers, for a brilliant presentation. I have uh, questions in um, two topics. Uh, one is on uh, mass timber structures and then on polymer composites. Uh, so Joe and other speakers uh, did mention on uh, uh, CLD and then glue lam in uh, structures. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, I saw your presentation on scale and massing and uh, informing design slides. So there it was uh, clear, like, uh, the CLD and then glue lam can't be used in high-res structures. I was wondering, like, why uh, is is it the fire dynamics causing it, or uh, restrain, uh, restraining it to not use in high-risk structures, or, or uh, what is like, uh, is it any uh, steel advancement required? So the second question in polymer composites is, uh, so what is the scope of having uh, polymer or biocomposites in uh, sustainable uh, structures? Okay, that's more Joe, I think. To be yeah, great. <laughs> Super technical structural question. Um, so, but really interesting, and this is a key thing. We can build buildings in CLT and tool, and the white architecture of building one at the minute, I think it's finished. Fantastic building, I think, probably in Scandinavia somewhere where it's always leading, um, which is well worth a look. So it is technically possible. It is all feasible. What we actually have, this fire risk, and the fire risk isn't quantifiable as such yet. We're slowly getting there. Ironically, the best thing that could happen for timber buildings is if one burnt down and then we'd have a case study. I'm not endorsing that, just <laughs> for clarity. That is not the snippet that goes out with this. Um, but it would be very helpful. But it, it relates directly to your second point as well. We can use these kind of materials, but we're in a risk-averse kind of insurance market. Getting warranties for these things and proven kind of characteristics during fire and structural loading systems, particularly over 60 years, it just isn't there yet. So to overcome any of these kind of new innovative materials, and I say new and innovative very loosely, CLT has been around for a long time, right? Um, it's those kind of testing that you need. So when you start to look at sort of 
composites and reinforced polymers and whatever else, all those kind of exciting things. Yes, you can probably do it in a small housing if somebody's willing to take the risk. They don't have a mortgage, for instance. They don't need the warranties. If you're looking at a six-story building that's going to be procured by a public body, it's just not a chance. The risk profile isn't there. But we need a kind of blended approach. So you need to have these smaller houses pushing it, looking at that kind of innovative solutions. And then you need to start to have clients who start to adopt it. The archetype building that Gary showed, the uh, East Angular one in, I forgot what it's called, Enterprise Centre, uh, which is fantastic, had an amazing client on board, John French, who really pushed and pushed and pushed and embraced all of that discussion and was prepared to take some of that risk on and work out ways of mitigating it. Not every client is going to be like that. So it's risk, it's insurance, it's warranties, it's all of the kind of tedious stuff that sits outside it, but those are the things that make a building work. So... You can do it, get the paperwork. And Gary, you some contribution? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, going to use the, I'm going to answer the question first, and then I'm going to use it to pivot to an earlier question. So, yeah, we, we really tried, I mean, the University of Glasgow were really keen first to use mass timber. Really, that's it. We were all pushing. And we went through the, uh, you know, through exactly what Joe was saying. Uh, and that's where the um, in situ concrete came out, um, uh, you know, better. But but the thing is, it's the it's the analysis you've got to do in order to then prove that. I mean, I was sceptical for a start. I mean, I'm I'm not having concrete, no, oh, no, over my dead body. And then, all oh, right, okay, right. So and so you've got to go through the analysis, right? That's the first thing. Um, then contrasting it with HOK, we're a global firm. Uh, you know, we've got 20 offices in the states and Canada and so forth. Uh, contrast with that, um, you know, basically the codes in North America and Canada, um, uh, you know, really understand timber, mass timber use. So you can actually go uh, over 20, 40 stories. You can do amazing things over there. And then because they've got that kind of ability, they, they, they've tested, they've burnt things first off, and they've got that test data, and then they actually make it open to everyone in terms of what the test data is. All the codes are based on test data, and so therefore there's a confidence in terms of uh, structural engineers, architects, uh, clients, that we all understand and we, we all can buy into. Fast forward to where we are in the UK, uh, really we've, we've had 50 years of, um, uh, we ripped up building research establishment, we privatised it. Uh, all the fire data, as you know, all the testing is done on a project level. You know, it's 30 to 50,000 pounds a test. All that data is IP'd. It's all hidden away. We don't share it. We don't know what's going on. Uh, so then the fire engineered approach uh, is really, it's all a bit of black book. We don't know, and that's why we don't trust it, because we don't have that open data. So it really comes back to this whole thing, and it's the same across every outcome you can think about. The more open and standardised we do our testing, the better we can understand what the risks are. Um, so that is really, I think, a failure of the entire system, which we need to correct quite fast. Come back to the thing, really, yeah, anything low-rise, really, anything below 11 metres, you know, go for it. You know, go for that kind of um, mass timber approach. It, it really is fantastic. Um, and there's certain kind of techniques um, in terms of glues and types of timber. Fantastic project in, in London, which uses, uh, a, it's a beach, um, a CLT, uh, and then it's got higher density, so therefore they managed to get that through. So it's, I think it's a six-story building, I think, so some of that. So, so, yeah, great. So really go for it. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm going to input my own question. If I'm allowed, Nathan, is that all right? Um, so I, I think a, a little bit of what we picked up last week at that other event was also around how industry and academia in some ways seem to be ahead of policy, and certainly in Northern Ireland that seems to be the case, and I, I would put a lot of that maybe on, on the policy front down to fear, um, but you know, open to conversation on that. But what does seem to be the driver is the emergence of ESG and the EU taxonomy, and the financial institutions and how they are having a significant input in driving the standards. So my question is in that space, and I'm going to throw that to Debbie uh, first, to just maybe give us your thoughts around that and you know, whether you know what, what, what you think is going to happen there and how that will influence the, the, the whole construction sector going forward. And then I'll, I'll invite the other speakers to, to have a think around that. I think it's a, a key area. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the ESG sector's really growing, um, and I think it's, it's gaining importance, and I think you're right, industry and businesses are leading the way here, and there is, I'm not a policymaker, but I, th I think there is a, 
a culture of, of risk aversity um, here um, as well across policymakers, and, and I think that's why you're seeing businesses taking the lead, um, partly because that's what the market is actually ask, asking for now, and that's what um, people that occupy buildings want, uh, and I think that's really driving things. Um, I think another really interesting sector that's driving this is the financial services sector, and the, particularly the Task Force for Disclosure on climate-related impacts and biodiversity impacts as well. I, I don't think we can understate the impact of that. That's, that was uh, at the, the, the Glasgow COP, bringing that in. It, it didn't get much fanfare at the time, but that, I think that has really transformed things because um, banks and the financial institutions are increasingly mapping their, their lending books and their loan portfolios and um, investors are, are actually looking at impact impact investments now as well. So you've got this full spectrum of sustainable finance products uh, and I think that's really driving change as well and, it, and it's, it's, it's really, really good to see and I think the policy makers will probably catch up yeah. Um, later. No, th thanks, Debbie, and, and th that's along my own thoughts. Any, anyone else want to share their thoughts around that uh, on the panel, or do we feel? Oh, I, I, just a quick note. I think uh, you mentioned earlier on stranded assets. Um, you know, this has um, been discussed in financial um, sector in London for for you know, at least five years. Um, I, our big clients in London, all the main developers, they're. We are thinking ahead. Um, I, you know, obviously, I can't say any names, uh, but a building that was only finished about seven years ago is uh, being slowly offloaded by one client because they know it's it might not hit resilience targets. That's a seven-year-old building, so think about that. So, so whatever we do, we've got to think about that. And as it comes back to Glasgow, you know, we're testing so future climate, so the future probable uh, probabilistic modelling of climate change on our buildings, we need to do that regularly, or else we're going to end up with stranded assets. So, That's, that's really an, an interesting example. Um, I have one more question to just chuck in. I'm, I'm going to throw this at, at Una. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to, recently to just uh, supervise another young girl who was doing her PhD in TU Delft School of Architecture in, in Holland, and she had put forward in her thesis this whole concept of something that's emerging out of the EU as well around sufficiency, efficiency, and then renewables. In identified a little bit of that in your presentation around sufficiency first in many ways, and I know there's this ongoing sort of language around what's first, and Alan's promoting form first and fabric first as a thing, and on LinkedIn there's been a lot of discussion around that. But the, the, whole, the whole concept of sufficiency first really does strike me, and if, myself and Kieran, with regards to one of the, the most recent consultations, there is a little bit in planning potentially coming into play as well, and you're also from a planning background, around maybe how future planning guidelines might actually address sufficiency in terms of the metre squared. And I'm thinking primarily of residential here and how much or how big we make our buildings compared to maybe other parts of Europe. So there's a lot in that, but um, over to you to That's unpack. Question. I think um, for Luna. Actually, on that, I was listening to the Zero Construct podcast on the way down the road here this morning, but they were talking about if we look at everything, so I might not address your question, but anyway, uh, carbon per metre squared or carbon per 100 kev um, project value, we don't actually look at the fact that we need to reduce that metre squared. Um, and that's probably one of the main things. There is so many buildings in this country, within Belfast specifically, that are probably a lot bigger than they need to be. Um, there's a lot more buildings than we might need to be constructing at this time. Um, there is a lot with the planning system where if you can zoom out and you can say, right, over the next 20 years, we're predicting that there's going to be however many thousands of people moving into Belfast city centre because historically we haven't had that many people living in the city centre. Just due to our lovely past. Um, but the goal with Belfast City Council is to bring more people in. How then do we address that where a contractor is not just looking at one building, um, they have to then take that wider approach as well, but that has to be driven from the planning system. And at the minute, our planning regulations fall far short of what we need. Um, I would say we would not reach 
net zero based on the planning system that we currently have in place. The London system is a lot better, um, but it's nowhere near what the European system is. Um, but there is lessons to be learned, and within the UK we can learn from London, and within the UK we can learn from even our neighbours in Ireland who are doing a lot as well. Um, what was your question? <laughs> No, it, it was around the sufficiency bit um, as well. So just again, you, you in some ways have addressed it quite quite comprehensively around how, how it's such a useful thing. So before we get into measuring all the various things, j just by simply reducing the metre squared in the first place, which is part of the narrative that we've had this morning in other presentations as well, is probably the single biggest thing that you can do off the bat straight away, and, and, and that's been said. Um, Siobhan, at the other end, you, you might have something you want to add in that space. I've seen you looking at me. Yeah, before. no, certainly. Um, I, I'm actually doing a project at the minute with a student where we've been looking at the kind of the construction impacts for, from the residential sector uh, in Northern Ireland and comparing that with uh, the rest of the UK. Um, and because our buildings, unsurprisingly, because our residential buildings are larger, our construction impacts are larger. Um, and there is a question there to ask, why are our residential buildings larger? Do they need to be larger? Um, they are larger than the rest of the UK. The rest of the UK is larger than continental Europe. Um, continental Europe is larger than many other parts of the world. We, we have a question that we need to ask ourselves and we need to think about. Um, I don't know, I'm not telling what the answer is, but I think it's something we need to be aware of. Brilliant. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that's been two from me. I can't be selfish, even though I'd love to keep going. Um, we have a hand up here with the, your, your, your fellow with your glasses, and then yourself, who had a hand up previously, and then Kieran Fox. So we'll take, we'll take those three um, together. So one, two, three. Um, hi. Yeah, this is probably for Una as well. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of the team buy-in and training and everything, you sort of touched on the fact that maybe we shouldn't have a separate sustainability team. But obviously, there's a degree of people doing their current jobs and not having the scope or the knowledge or maybe the access to information to be able to integrate that into their current roles. How do you kind of see sustainability consultants and wider teams being able to integrate that into their like daily functions? Um, what I mean about the sustainability team, I'm part of ours and I love it, it's brilliant. We do a lot of good work, but we don't always have the influence over, say, procurement, and we don't always have the influence to make those big decisions. Sometimes it can be seen as an add-on. Sometimes it can be seen as a bit of an inconvenience for the site manager, whoever else. We went with the Carbon Literacy Project, so I developed a carbon literacy training program for construction industry professionals. What I did was translate carbon into everyone's job role, and it takes the fear away. Some people who have been in the industry 20 years are going, now what's this new thing that I have to care about or have to you know, take up time out of my day to address? Carbon should become the fundamental thing that we have to base things on, along with biodiversity, along with social impact. They should be embedded into our job roles so that it doesn't become the add-on. You're finding that now with um, the engineers coming through and the um, quantity surveyors coming through, sustainability is embedded into their learning. So we had the Southwest College ones in recently, and they were like, oh yeah, we don't have a separate sustainability module. It's throughout everything. It's This is how it relates to sustainability, which I think is brilliant. There isn't probably as much work in sustainability or whole life carbon measurement from the contractor's point of view as you think. If you have a bill of quantities, stick a carbon factor beside it. It's not that big of a deal. Like, we're going through a lot of the teething issues at the minute where we're saying, oh, well, this doesn't work and this doesn't work. But once we have that finished methodology, that is just, you know, an extra column on the spreadsheet for the QS. And then it goes to the procurement team to actually start sourcing that. It goes to the site manager. They don't have to do anything, basically. They just have to make sure it's whatever was in the bill of quantities. We're going to have maybe a period here where people are a bit fearful and they don't want to take a step back. They don't want this to be added on to their daily requirements because people are busy. We are stretched to the limit. Um, I totally understand that. What's been brilliant with the KTP is I am totally external to everybody, which means then I have the ability to go around every single team and say, how would this work with you? Where's the issue here? So for example, we recently had the site manager sit down, the contracts manager and the QS on a new project we have going, and I said, how can I put this into the tender documents? And they went, well, this wouldn't work. We can't say this. This wouldn't work. And then we finally got it. And we went, we'll put this wee paragraph in that says, we want an EPD. And in the next two years, we're changing our policy. You'll have to have an EPD. 
that was it. And then that means it takes the pressure off the QS. They need to understand carbon factors as much as anybody else. They don't have to understand exactly every single element of that APD. They need to know what the carbon figure per functional unit is. There is a wealth of resources available. We've got the teams in now, instead of me always talking at them, we go for like a lunch and learn. And we have the COB webinar in the background. Supply Chain Sustainability School will be everyone's greatest friend. It is a wealth of resources there, all free webinars, different courses that you can go on. It's not as scary as you think. And I'm coming at this from technically not a construction background. I'm coming from a planning background. What I've learned in two years, most people who have an engineering degree or QS degree will be able to do this in a week. So take the fear away, translate carbon into every single person's job role, and definitely encourage it from the top down in the business. If you have senior management buy-in, like I said with Felix O'Hare, went for the PV panels. That seems like a, an easy win for us. But it meant then everybody from our workshop team to um, our admin team, they all went, oh, well, that's brilliant. That's what we're doing. And it makes sense to them. And they go, we're saving money over the year. Um, we're saving energy. It's brilliant. We're saving the planet. Get the buy-in. And the Carbon Literature Training Program is definitely a great way to do that. People can voice their concerns. They can say, how does this work? How does this not work? And you get the discussion going within the business. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, I, I think it was Joe's presentation that had the very, very simple equation up. I wouldn't even call it an equation. It was just what, what, you know, as simple as length by breadth in some respects. And, and that, that was very refreshing as well. Um, th th that was a very interesting response and a very interesting question. I'm going to ask, Can I, could Gary you? had a, a already come to me, and then Joe, and then Siobhan. So all of you input there. Oh, OK, I'll go very quick one. then. OK, <laughs> so I'm going to hand the ball. So yeah, I mean, great, great detail response. I think that. Um, you know, over the years, I've been, you know, teaching this and practicing it, and then heading sustainability in various firms. I think what it comes to is uh, it's it's actually we're not asking people to do a different job. It's actually to do the the job in terms of a design wise. It's the same job we've always had for two thousand years or so. It's just to do it well and better, and then with evidence. Uh, so that's really the main thing. And then from an uh, organisational point of view, it's uh, bottom-up, top-down, hearts and minds, and then any other thing that you need to do. You've got to do it multi multiple factors to then uh, try and achieve it. So I um, hope that helps. Joe? Yeah, I was, just to add to this, um, the whole design team should be involved. It shouldn't be an add-on. I think that's a really key point. The other thing that's really useful is for somebody to own it as a sustainability champion. They are not sitting there crunching numbers. They are there to be a critical friend to ensure that things get pushed forward. This is not a new thing. Soft landings came out in 2010, 2011, something like that. We recognised it back then. Bill Bordas has been talking about it for 30 years or something, saying that somebody just needs to own it. It's a much better way to do it. And it actually, in some ways, it's better if it's somebody in the client team rather than the design team. Somebody who's saying, what's the embodied carbon of this? And even if people don't know, it's a question. And eventually, people will start to be able to answer it. So a sustainability champion it is a really beneficial thing to have in it. Again, not number crunching. That's the design team. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, there's a really interesting book has recently been published, um, The Regenerative Engineer. Um, it's published to the iStruck D. And within that, there is a concept of the bookshelf and that there are a number of books on the bookshelf. And at the top of the bookshelf, there's the paradigm we live within. And then there's the values we, we take on board, uh, the norms that we act within, and then the practice that we actually adopt. Um, and I, I think absolutely, um, for all the reasons that have been explained, it's really useful to have someone with responsibility for sustainability. But unless we, as organizations, change, accept that there's a change in paradigm, change our values, um, change our practices throughout, um, throughout the organization, we're not going to change what we do. Um, so it needs to be the whole way through an organization. And we have, just as Una said, we've been doing this and working at this in Queens and all of our um, disciplines to try and make sure that sustainability um, and how we look at those wider aspects of our engineering how they are all integrated in what we do. And, and as I can't remember who said it, it's part of our job. It's not a bolt-on. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Uh, the, the only thing that I'll just throw in before we go to the next question is a big salute also to um, the carbon literacy thing in Southwest College. That is something that we're doing college-wide. And it's amazing where some of the solutions are coming from. You, you know, we've, we've very diverse 
areas of, of the curriculum like hair and beauty are coming with you know really good sustainability solutions out of nowhere for example um, clearly I'm a member of that um, <laughs> so we have a next question here and, and we'll come to that Sadiq Ali and a uh, few suggestions about the regulations you see people who have money have brains to know how to protect that but people who have brains designing things don't have enough brains to know how to get that money out into investment now, the situation here is that uh, there are two parts of the problem. One is the consumer, the other is the producer. If the consumer wants something which has more embodied carbon, then the regulation should be such that they should be ready to pay at the design level. When they are wanting a lot of fancy things in their house, those fancy things would raise the carbon footprint. And that is where the designer comes in. So when the designer is seeing that this thing is going beyond uh, the acceptable carbon footprint which is allowed, it should be more taxed at the design level, and that would uh, also help in the, uh, the you know, reduce, reduction of those things. I keep telling my children that if it is necessity, I'll pay for it. If it's luxury, it can wait for tomorrow. <laughs> now, here, if people want luxurious homes, they should be ready to pay for it at the design level. And then comes the producer's part. Now, if the producers are producing those things which are luxurious, or they don't have enough uh, you know, uh, efficiency and they are producing more carbon. So they are not ready to change their bed because they have to produce new dyes which will need more investment. So the uh, producers also should be taxed in a manner that if they can do not produce things which are energy efficient or have less embodied carbon, they should be taxed more. Now that would raise the cost of the product. But here is the important part of it, creating a balance that if these things, if like, you know, uh, electric vehicle, we decided we'll get rid of the internal combustion engines very soon. Mm -hmm. Now, if this such of type of regulations are placed, that the producers who, whose products are used in buildings, if they get onto this, then obviously they will be forced to uh, use those new inventions uh, before uh, then we expect. Hopefully that would solve the problem. And the other bit is that you have very good presentations. There are a lot of links. Can we have any link in the, in the email so that we know where to go and read what? Thank yes, you. certainly. Very interesting question. Gary, you put your hand up. Um, I'm thinking Joe for that as well, potentially. So between the two of you. Yeah, it's um, a polluter play principle. Uh, and uh, I think it's, and this is kind of coming to the paradigm shift, is <clears throat> for you know, sort of you know, decades. We've been working under um, uh, an economic system that's short term, uh, that then uh, the processes are all about sort of, you know, the, the resources are free and then we can use energy is quite cheap. So we're in transition. We can see that really is now it's really difficult choices now. What you're highlighting is really where we need to go. And ultimately it is a, it is a, the price of things should be measured by carbon, not by other means. So as soon as you apply that through the entire supply chain, then I think we can do, our job really is, is, is you know, it comes down to Joe in terms of, um, yeah, we can just, we do our bit in terms of sufficiency and, and other things. But ultimately that is the, I think the key thing that needs to happen in order to achieve uh, net zero. Yeah, I, I think there's this kind of idea of a green pound. You know, people will spend more if it's worthwhile. And there is an element of that. You always need people to be pioneering and willing to take a risk. Electric vehicles are a really good example before it becomes mainstream. And how you de-risk, that's a really interesting point for the market to have confidence to invest. I saw something the other day as a study by uh, the Actuarial Society, uh, by my colleague Tim Dendecker, who suggested that carbon pricing currently is four times too low. It needs to be four times higher, right? If you think about it, it needs to be four times higher, and this is what the financial market is basing their carbon analysis on and their funding analysis on, it is never going to incentivize a low carbon kind of industry. So there's always this kind of short-termism that Gary kind of hinted at. It's tricky. I think we need to be able to de-risk this kind of pioneering things. That's probably the first step. Um, and then finding how you leverage that kind of green pound. I think there's a great thing about getting leasing agents and estate agents to upsell low carbon buildings. Yeah. There's a great bit about educating them. They're an important bit of the slump, uh, supply chain. So a whole raft of things needs to change, but yeah, sorry, it's not a definitive answer, but we'll get there. Brilliant. Um, you stole my thunder on the um, 
price of carbon and what's going to happen there. Uh, also, interestingly, here in Northern Ireland, we have a, an estate agent that's moved to the, uh, along with the passive house space that's happening here with Fraser Miller around um, starting to capitalise on exactly that, and, and they probably will get an early mover reward. Um, Kieran Fox, the next question. So, if we can get a microphone to him, or, or just relax, Kieran, it's coming. Just when we're there, I'll just say. Jack also has, uh, or Joe also has a book out as well called Materials, so look out for that as well. It's very reasonably priced. Uh, it's, it's, it's available in all bookshop, uh, the RABA bookshop, that's it, I think. Uh, a straightforward one for Gary, first of all. Um, in terms of the performance gap, uh, does the research show that uh, Passive House has a smaller performance gap? Uh, and the question for everybody, uh, what advice would you give to a client who five years ago bought a big hunk of a building fully intending to demolish it but now wants to be a leader in the field and to show the rest of the world uh, how we should be approaching the, the drive towards net zero um, but of course they've invested in this big hunk of a building that they're planning to demolish they've started design work what advice would you give to that client okay so i'll pick up the first question first so the uh, performance gap, yeah, uh, I think it's, I think, uh, I think we're beyond the doubt now. I think that Pass Vice, um Institute and Trust have done the analysis. It's something that we've been asking for for many years, you know, 20 years or so, and they've done excellent uh, work where they've gone back in, they've done the post occupancy evaluation of the buildings, and then it, it achieves the what it says on the tin. So really, I think it's, you know, I, so I think it's really is one of those tools that we can sort of then say that, right, if you sign up for that, the measurement and verification process is there in, embedded as a quality control right the way through the golden thread, uh, and absolutely, so I think it's a to total thing. When it comes to larger buildings, the tool that we're going to, we're testing is called Neighbours, again from Australia, uh, really looking at a, a level of complexity which is kind of quite enormous more mechanical, ventilation driven, you know, so again, we need to use the same principle. But what it comes down to is really, is you set your outcome based on benchmarks, you know it's stretched, but you know it's deliverable, and you've got to follow through that sticker rock right the way through, right to the end and measure it at the end. So, so that's the first question. Uh, the second one is then, uh, in terms of embodied carbon of the big hulk of the building, um, I, you know, so basically all I'd say is, um, is uh, just refer to what's happening in London and Oxford Street. Uh, the MNSS uh, flagship store is uh, planned to be demolished. Uh, it was blocked by our friend Michael Gove, which is, he's from Aberdeen as well. So again, so I don't apologize for maybe if you, for, for that, but, but um, yeah, no, I think it's just look at what's happening. So, and then I think that um, a lot, and again, coming into London perspective, developers are looking at the court, there's gonna to go to court, so does the Secretary of State have the power to then block that? That's the thing that's going to test. I'm, I think it's 50-50, I don't know. If, he, if Michael Gove and the government win, that's going to be a game changer for all, all the developers. So the developers are all looking at this in detail. We've got one project that won't get through Westminster planning until we've done the nth degree of analysis to look at retention of the building and what we do to new build. And what it comes down to is then, it's a complex building type. So again, we've got to try and prove to the planning that actually we might have to kind of, um, you know, demolish part of it to, in order to achieve the use. But it's that, it's that stringent just now, so. I would say on your second point, there is a great example here in Belfast with the PwC headquarters and Felix Herr with the contractor on it, but they retained the structure of the three different buildings in the city centre and were able to amalgamate it. I think they retained 70 or 80% of the structure. The embodied carbon saved by not demolishing those structures and then also linking back in with the heritage in the area. Um, it's incredible what they were able to achieve and it, Felix O'Hare hadn't done a project like that before. We undertook it, we knew there was risks involved but we were able to deliver it. We delivered it to the highest level of Briam as well for a commercial property in Belfast. There is examples in the UK where this is being done, and I think de-risking it, and de-risking it especially for the contractor who has to undertake it then, if you're gonna go for the retrofit and retain um, option, is so important. Alan, you look ready. Um, Sorry for yeah. the Kieran, to answer your second question, first thing, a, a bit of advice would be stop, yeah? And uh, think, uh, I would suggest it's old thinking, um, and actually to think smarter. Um, I would uh, 
highlight to them, for example, the project in um, Victoria Street in, in London by Lynch Architects, where actually there's advantages in looking at uh, low carbon, stroke zero carbon construction, uh, both from a top down in that there are invest ethical investors. That project was funded by the Canadian School Teachers uh, Retirement Fund, and they would only invest in certain projects. But then also, um, that then attracted a blue chip tenant, Deutsche Bank, because they wanted to be seen to be in um, a very sustainable building. And they wanted to be in a susta very sustainable building because it would then attract employees. Because the employees who uh, are very becoming discerning as well, they want to have all the, um, the bells and whistles of a low uh, sustainable, you know, not decoration, Joe, yeah, uh, but all the, the, the various um, sort of credentials of a um, uh, very sustainable building. So that's, that would be my advice. So definitely don't demolish, stop, think smart, think sustainable, and it's the way forward. Thanks for the example, that's very good. Sh Siobhan, and then um, Debbie. Um, I would say a really important thing to do is to stop. Um, and while you're having that thought process, make sure you've got the right design team on board, um, a design team that's going to be open-minded, that shares the value system, that's going to look at all the options, that's going to um, and, and give, give them enough time to come up with a, a good design that actually satisfies all the needs that, that are there. And then when you do retrofit, don't forget about embodied carbon at that point as well. So choose materials for your retrofits that make it operationally as, as good as it can be but also um, performing from an embodied carbon point of view as well. Kieran, um, so you've just bought this building. I guess I'm going to be I'm going to be a bit precocious here. If, if you just bought this building, probably what I would say to you is, uh, Kieran, I'm really sorry. Um, there are no policy incentives here for you. Um, probably not going to get a grant, um, and you're not really going to get any tax breaks. So I'm really sorry about that. But what I would say is the market wants this, tenants want this, and you've got a really, really strong industry here in Northern Ireland and a lot of expertise, as we've heard today, um, within that sector to be able to support you to do this in a really, really cost-effective way. I, I feel left out if I don't speak, so, uh, <laughs> and I like the sound of my voice. So, I agree with everything that's been said. You've got this building, it's, it's a hunking mass of embodied carbon and operational energy, right? And it's built from thinking from the old times, and you can't stop it. Just own it. I think it's really important you talk about and discuss it and say, now, this is what we do differently. And I think it's incumbent on all of us not to just point a finger and say, that's a monstrosity. I think it's to look at it and say, what could we do better now? We're in this kind of world of populist politics and petty infighting. That is not going to solve the climate crisis. We all need to work together and support each other and collaborate. Don't divide. Get everybody together. Look at it and go, if we did it again, CLT, better grid sizes, no raised access floors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> collaborate is the way forward, not division. Brilliant. Um, thanks, thanks, everybody, for that. We're coming close to the end. So uh, I, I just wanted to throw in one more thing before I get a few words from each of you, just to finish. Um, I, I, I'm really impressed with the way in which Queen's has ramped up its level of ambition around its, its net zero plan going forward and to do it 10 years ahead of industry as well. Again, the level of ambition is, is what I would call leadership in every respect. But um, just again, myself coming from the FE sector, maybe this is to Alan and Siobhan in particular, I think, um, both being Queen's representatives in the panel. It is, um, we were fortunate enough in South West College to realise some international opportunities with our own Earn campus, which was built to the Passive Standard. Passive standard Standard's global. Um, and with that, that was one of the, the key enablers that helped our business case with the Department of Economy to, to go for a building of that standard. Is there any plans within Queen's to, you know, um, maybe leverage such opportunities? Uh, and specifically, what, what we have been able to do is to, you know, strike a relationship with Penn State University in Pittsburgh and uh, they have a, a passive house building there, and also Humber College in Toronto, and they have a passive house building. So the question is really about w what is happening there, or what is trickling down into the curriculum 
um, in both your prospective schools, or the, each the, the one school, school in Natural Mountain Barrow? <laughs> We're both looking at each other. Well, uh, I, I, where I would start uh, with a response to that question is, I think it would be important to involve Queen's uh, Estates because um, what you're talking about is, um, sorry, I've got my back slightly to no, you. No, you're okay. Yeah. Um, is we all need to be uh, living and working in um, environments that are sort of leading edge if we want to uh, enjoy what we're doing, but also inspiring us to be at our best and doing our best work. So um, uh, you've done that in your college. Um, I think Queen's have got some really good examples. One here, one would argue, but one across just the way. We can look as we leave. Um, and uh, so th there's that, you know, there's the, let's call it the physical, but then what you're also talking about is the curriculum, um, which is around, um, for example, now within architecture at Queen's, approximately 30 to 40% of our intake is international. So um, we're very much not uh, uh, only thinking of how do we talk about be, uh, uh, creating sustainable buildings and environments and projects here in Northern Ireland. We're also wanting to equip our graduates as when they leave and they go back to China, Malaysia, North America, Central Europe and so on, that they are equipped to actually carry the conversation and uh, make, uh, have the right um, uh, arguments mm -hmm. ready to actually um, manifest that uh, sustainable uh, environment that we all want and we all need. Brilliant. Um, and just then to add to that as well, like we're so lucky here that we, we work with so many people who, who do world-class cutting-edge research, um, and it's making sure that that makes its way into the curriculum as well. I have colleagues who are top of their field in structural health monitoring, for example, so when we talk about retrofits, can we integrate that structural health monitoring into a building to really understand what the capacity is for, for refurb in the future? Um, I have colleagues who are looking at novel, um, novel materials, looking at really reducing the carbon footprint of cement and concrete. Um, I have one colleague who is developing a, a cementless concrete, other colleagues who are looking at carbon sequestration within concrete. Um, digital technologies have great potential and they are integrated within our course as well. Um, so we, whenever we can, we leverage that research that is going on within the university to make sure we are providing really up-to-date um, potential solutions to many of the challenges we're talking about. Okay, and Gary, very briefly... Yeah, just really briefly, um, yeah, we won't achieve uh, all our ambitions uh, without upskilling. So, in the, and it's something that, obviously, Alan, myself, and RBA and various other things, is so important, and that's through the entire supply chain. Um, <clears throat> I think we're in transition, so, you know, again, we're upskilling sort of just now, but we need to up the pace. Um, I'm hopeful all our school children are really taught fantastic principles of climate change. They are, they, are, they are really amazing. And they come into the university sector and perhaps that's, that isn't as good. I mean, it's great we've got some fantastic um, sort of people here, but we need to really upskill right the way through the chain or we won't achieve it. Brilliant. I have a feeling... <laughs> can, I, can I come back with one other thought? Please, yeah. Sorry. Um, I think as well it's been alluded to by many of, of um, our speakers this morning as they spoke with the idea of moving beyond sustainability. So sustainability is about doing what we do at the minute and reducing the impact so that it, it's, it's no longer uh, negative. But we, we're in the middle of a, a biodiversity crisis as well as a climate crisis. We're beginning to see that we're passing the point where just doing no more harm is not enough. We need to change what we do as well. Um, and those principles are being, beginning to be integrated within our courses as well and within our research. Brilliant. And all of you are going to have one last chance to contribute with this. Um, just before we close the event, uh, I want to ask each of the panel members, okay, and, and this, is, this next bit is very important, in a few words, <laughs> uh, <laughs> might leave you last, Alan. Um, what one intervention would you implement tomorrow, and uh, it, it, you know, to drive sustainability in construction? So I maybe start with you, Siobhan, and finish with Alan. Um, given that my research is in the measurement of embodied carbon, I'm going to say get people to measure, because I think once we start to measure things, we begin to quantify it, um, and we begin to understand where we can make improvements. If we don't measure things, we won't know. 
Um, I got a Fitbit a couple of years ago. I do a lot more steps now than I used to. Um, and it's a really common um, phenomenon that once we measure, we change our behaviors. So if you're not already doing it, start doing some of those basic calculations. The FCBS tool is available. The iStruct E tool I use all the time in teaching. It's brilliant. Um, and sort of at the later stages, as Una was saying, some of those Revit tools are brilliant as well. So, so there are loads of opportunities to start to measure. Barry, I'm going to give a shout out for the trades because you're not on this panel, um, but I think what you're doing in a southeast regional college is really, really key. And I think um, the biggest risk we've got here is the, the, the trades. If we look across the industry, we've got really aging workforce and we actually need more and more people to go into the trades. And I think um, that's a big risk. And I'd say, like, if we had to do one thing, let's have a real push on trades. And, and getting kids into really technical trades, because I think the industry really needs that. Agree. Just work way down. Um, <clears throat> so the one thing, I hear there's this fantastic new book you can all buy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, collaborate. You won't know all the answers to all of the questions. I know less and less about more and more. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I think just collaborate, ask lots of questions, create a, a network around you of people you can really talk to and share. I talk to Gary all the time. And it's not just in your little silo, it's beyond your silos. So you talk about the whole university, talk about different universities, talk about clients, talk about structural engineers, talk about designers, talk about the trades. I think that's really important. And if you can't find that network, make it yourself. So just find ways to collaborate. Brilliant. Um, I would say start the conversation. Go back and do your work now, this afternoon, or wherever you're going, and just ask, do we have a net zero strategy? Do we have a direction of travel for the next five years? What way is this business going? Um, and don't be afraid in whatever role you're in just to start that conversation. I go in and talk to builders with 25 years experience in the industry, and they look at me and go, what? And I go, yeah, we have to change it all, basically. But start the conversation, take the fear away. We do not have time to sit back and, you know, fiddle about and not actually address the issue. So it's the elephant in the room. Go in and just start talking about it. Okay, um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, we've, together, I mean, the, the net zero building standard is the result of, my goodness, decades of, uh, of actually thought. Uh, it, we're almost there. We're in striking distance of the standards that we've been working all our adult lives for. So I hope that please use it when it comes out, first thing, and then push your governments to then sign up for it. Because once we do that, then everything else then falls into place. In a few words, um, encourage, uh, enc understand, do, and promote evidence-based design. Um, when I'm talking to uh, students across uh, Architecture at Queen's, I explain it's no longer I want and I like. Where we are now is about what's appropriate and what is best practice. So if we're able to have conversations, that's my experience of practice, that you can promote innovative new solutions based on helping uh, your client understand and your colleagues and teammates within the design team understand what is best practice, how you can uh, weave into it uh, standards uh, and uh, guidance and so on. And before you know it, you're doing something that is really leading edge, best practice, that people want to talk about, they want to visit, and that the owners are proud of, and that people want to come and work in and um, study in, etc. So that's my advice. Brilliant. Um, that, that's really good. I'm going to hand over to Sarah Lynch now, just from Queen's in, in a moment. The, the last bit that I just wanted to throw in was, I think this has all been very, very positive. It's focused more on the, the can-do than the can't, and I think that's a really nice tone um, to, to leave you with today. So I'll hand over to Sarah for just a few last words.
Um, hi, everybody. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed this event as much as I have. Um, some really engaging, informative um, discussion um, from our panelists and from our speakers that I'll really be taking away and reflecting on um, specific even to what we're doing here at Queen's. We've been really thrilled with the level of interest, um, kind of blown away, really. Um, we anticipated perhaps around 50 people might come along to this event. So it's so fantastic to see that people are engaged and interested and really want to see progress um, within Northern Ireland on this. We want to hear your thoughts about this event. We want to see what we could do differently, how we can continue this conversation. So I hope there's a QR code on the screen now. Um, please do um, link on to that, or um, when you go back to your offices, we'll share it again and tell us what you thought and what you think we could do differently um, to really build um, on the momentum and the conversations we've had. And go away to your workplaces, um, have the discussions, as Una was saying, have the conversations now about what are you doing and what could could you do better um, in this space? I just want to close up by thanking um, a few people. Um, thank each of you for coming along and listening so attentively and giving of your time and all the contributions that have been made. Um, a special thank you to our speakers, to our panellists and to our facilitator. Massive thank you to Barry for coming along today and, and really joining all this event and the speakers um, together. Um, also want to um, say a special thank you to School of Natural Built Environment. Um, so we talk about collaboration. Um, we're really keen and we're really, really grateful for the expertise that we have um, in Queen's um, and within Natural Built Environment. So special thank you to Alan Jones, um, to Siobhan, to Stephen and to Tara, who we do engage with on a regular basis um, through projects and through the things that we're doing here and even in the development um, of this event. It's really appreciated and to um, our sustainability team here at Queen's, um, particularly Nathan and Rachel, um, who've put a lot of effort into putting this event together. So do share your thoughts on this and go back and reflect in your workplaces and let's see this be a driver um, for progress in this area. And I hope you really enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.